feel free to come to the front of the room. I am Monica Hakimi from Columbia Law School, and I'm very delighted to be uh, moderating this panel on repairing war injuries, reconstruction, compensation mechanisms, and transitional justice. Um, as anyone can tell simply by paying attention to the news these days, conflicts appear to be on the rise in many parts of the world. So we have, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the situation in the Middle East with Gaza at the epicenter, but of course, ripple effects uh, spiraling out throughout the region, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, developments in the South China Sea, throughout the African Sahel, we have um, Islamist groups and other extremist groups um, disrupting state um, authority. And then of course we have internal conflicts in Sudan and Libya and the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And our panel today is asking the question of how compensation mechanisms might respond to and address some of the injuries suffered as a result of armed conflicts. There is not as you might know, a uniform model for establishing some such mechanisms. It's not even guaranteed that such a mechanism will be established. And so, so these, these, these compensation mechanisms are sort of crafted for the conflicts in which they've, they, are, they are designed to address. Um, but we have a number of them now. So we have uh, as precedents, um, and uh, as precedents on which our panelists today will speak, the UN Claims Commission, which was established after the Iraq's after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990 and 1991 war. We have the UN Register of Damages relating to the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territories, or UNRWAD. We have the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission, and more recently the Register for Damages for Ukraine. Now these mechanisms carry enormous weight on their shoulders. They carry on their shoulders the demand for justice and accountability for, from those who have suffered grave injuries as a result of war. And they also carry on their shoulders the desire for forward movement and to move to a new place and, and hopefully a better place. And the so the task is almost monumental. You might even think impossible in a certain way. And nevertheless, the question is, how do they fare in these conditions? Uh, what, are the, what are the circumstances um, for and the attributes of success or failure? And how do we even think about success or failure given the kinds of things that they're trying to address? Our panelists today are extraordinary and so we'll bring great insight on these questions. So just um, in order in which they appear from my immediately left, I'll introduce them briefly and then we'll jump into the conversation. So to my immediate left, we have Patrick Pearsall who is the head of Allen and Overy's arbitration practice in the America and director of the Columbia Law School Claims and Reparations Project. Uh, one over from him, we have Mark Jan Kliochowski, the executive director of the Register of Damages Caused by the Aggression of the Russian, Russian Federation Against Ukraine. One over still, Emma Lindsay, the co-chief executive officer of the Clooney Foundation for Justice. And then on our screen here, Mariana Salazar Albornoz, a board member on the UN Register of Damages caused by the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now we've decided to structure this panel more like a conversation than like a series of presentations. So I'll start off by asking our panelists some questions. And then when we have, with a little time to spare, I'll open the field uh, to the audience. I have been told that there is, um, that to submit questions, please go to the app and click on this panel in the app and specifically click, click on the little plus sign that appears next to this panel so that you can add the panel to your roster. And at that point, you'll have access to the Q&A function and you could submit questions and answers, which I will receive on my little iPad right here. So. Without further ado, uh, why don't we get the conversation started? And Patrick, perhaps I can start with you and just ask you um, to help us think about, you know, as we as we lay the land for these various compensation mechanisms that exist, um, how do you think about um, trying to construct such a mechanism from scratch? And what what inspires the effort? And then how do you go about um, conceiving and getting it off the ground and looking at precedents and then forming something that is responsive to the particular moment, in your case, Ukraine, um, but also draws on the lessons learned from the other mechanisms that have 
um, existed to date. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much. I mean, it, it is a daunting. It's a, it's a daunting question, and it's a daunting uh, task. I, I think that one way to get at that question is to to take a few minutes and explain w what we did, because I don't think that there's any blueprint necessarily on creating a claims commission. Every uh, it's it's like a enzyme and a protein. Every conflict and every resolution and claims commission needs to be fit for purpose in a, in a very nuanced way. So I don't think there's any blueprint for it. But of course, even though the it, the Ukraine context, and we'll tease out some of this over the next hour, is incredibly unique. It's incredibly unique. Challenges that we we haven't faced in previous examples, those examples existed. So we weren't really starting from a, a standing start. But I thought it might be nice just to kind of recount a little bit of, of the history, um, because it, it will show you both the, the ad hoc bespoke nature of this and also the kind of power that we as international lawyers can, can, can um, e exert uh, based on our, our history. So about two weeks into the full-scale invasion, um, Markian, at the behest of the president of Ukraine, gave, gave me a call and said, how, how, how do we pay, how, make the Russians pay for the aggression that they are uh, causing? And how, do, how will that work? Now, just the, the power of that question, two weeks into a full-scale invasion, when um, the, 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 the success uh, of, of Ukraine was not as clear, um, is, is a, powerful, it's a powerful moment, right? And the fact that it was an international law question was even more powerful. So a week later, I was here in ASOL, and we decided, okay, we're going to do something. Um, and the first thing we decided to do was ask experts, and some of you are in the room. Um, we convened a series of expert roundtables to discuss what some of the challenges of the, creating a claims commission for Ukraine would be. Uh, some of those challenges were immediately apparent, right? Um, every previous claims commission had um, a conflict that had ended, and the, the agreement of the, the belligerents or those who involved in the conflict to jurisdiction, to a, to a mechanism, here obviously we didn't have that. What international legitimacy could we gain? Um, how would we go about getting that international legitimacy? What are some of the unique aspects with regard to funding a commission or, or a claims mechanism that doesn't have buy-in from the, the, the violator. Um, and so like all of those questions gave us a lot of things to think about. Um, but we basically didn't, didn't kind of stop with those challenges. We didn't get bogged down. We moved forward politically. And over the course of the year, Mark Jan and I went to capitals uh, all across the world. I think we visited something uh, like 73 different jurisdictions, virtual and in person. Um, and obviously talked to, to key stakeholders in the G7. And what we decided was, in the face of all the no's that we were getting, you can't do this, not, not right now, um, there's too many questions, you know, you've never done this before, et cetera. Um, we reminded capitals that they started setting up the Nuremberg Commission in 1940. That was long before uh, the Allies um, re, re -invade, or invaded um, uh, Europe or to take back, to liberate Europe. So we just decided we're going to build this train. We're going to start the train moving. And we met um, in The Hague. Many of you, some of you were in that meeting. We drafted a UN resolution. We pushed forward. We were told, no, you don't want a UN resolution. You don't want to go to the UNGA to create this. That's never been done before. Um, the UNCC was created through the Security Council. But we thought, move the train. Once you move the train and the train's moving, people need to make a decision whether they're going to get on it or, or allow it to, to, to go without them. And our calculus was that it was going to get buy-in. Um, and now we have a headquarters. The Council of Europe is administrating it. The G7 is completely bought in. We got um, a, a very good result in a, a UN General Assembly resolution that passed on November 14th. I'm going very fast here. And what that General Assembly resolution did for the first time, for the first time, is said, a damages registry needs to be created, but, and there's precedent for that. 
and for a reparation, uh, uh, for an international harm, reparations are due. Obviously, that's black letter law. But what it did was it linked the creation of a damages registry and the harm, the state responsibility harm, to a mechanism, what we call the mechanism, which will be hopefully soon the commission. And Mark Young will speak more on that. And that syllogism, I think, is 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 unique to or was new to international law. And and it's been off and running since. So let me let me stop there and then we can do a, a comparative later. Great. Thank you so much. And Mariana, that's maybe a good opportunity to ask you to share your experiences um, working on UNRWAD, because of course UNRWAD's origin story is quite different from the origin story for the Ukraine Register for Damages. And so could you tell us a little bit about, again, just as part of the laying of the land and some of the issues that you confront that you confront in your position, um, how UNRWAD came to be and what some of the possibilities and constraints and issues were um, arising out of sort of that, the, the, the its genesis. Absolutely, Monica, and thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be joining uh, this panel. So, um, yes, it is different to, to the example that Patrick mentioned, but it also shares a similarity, which is the fact that it also faced um, the challenge of finding an innovative way to go around some political blockages um, at that time. So I think that uh, UNRWA is an example also of a flexible and innovative uh, design of a mechanism. So for, for all of those who do not know, the UNRWA is the United Nations Register of Damage caused by the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, it came as a result of the advisory opinion issued by the International Court of Justice on, in 2004 on the consequences arising from the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territory. And in that advisory opinion, the ICJ recognized that Israel has the obligation to make reparation for the damage caused to all natural or legal persons concerned as a result of the, of the wall. And um, this included a specific mention of the obligation to return the land, the orchards, the olive groves, and other movable property seized, but also an obligation to compensate all material damage. As a result of this advisory opinion, the states that had proposed uh, the request of the advisory opinion within the General Assembly saw that there would be no space or no political um, uh, will, probably, to create actually a, a compensation mechanism where Israel would be willing to pay damages. So the innovative solution that was found was precisely to create a record of damages. And this was created as a result of a General Assembly resolution. This is also a, a, a first, also in the story of in the history of, of compensations or claims commissions. Um, so the decision to create a record of the damage caused by the construction of the wall was adopted by a resolution of the General Assembly in 2007. And UNRWA's mandate is precisely uh, to serve as a record in documentary form of the damage caused to all natural and legal persons concerned as a result of the construction of, of the wall by Israel. There are two important uh, things to, to point out from this resolution. The resolution does note that the act of registration of damage as such does not entail at this stage an evaluation or assessment of the loss of the damage caused by the construction of the wall. And also, uh, the resolution says that as long as the wall exists and as long as the wall is there, it must be, the register for damage must be open for claims. And this is a very important point. So um, in light of this, uh, UNRWA was created as a subsidiary organ of the General Assembly. It has an office in the Vienna International Center of the UN. Um, and it allows, uh, well, it has a board of three members, um, which, which we were recently appointed as a new composition of the board in October 2002. It has a secretariat, which is headed by an executive director, and it has 19 staff members. Um, this includes uh, three staff that actually work as claim intake intakers on the ground. We have been, uh, we have intake claims uh, at all the nine affected governorates. Um, and uh, a lot of the first initial tasks of the functioning of UNRWA uh, since it started its functions in 2007 were precisely to agree upon a claim form, 
to agree upon the categories of claims that were, be, were to be accepted. Uh, these include agricultural, commercial, residential, employment, access to services, public resources, and others. And as I mentioned, it's it's very interesting in the fact in the sense that not only individuals can submit claims, but also um, institutions, also also uh, legal persons. So. Um, the, the, the result of the work of ONRAR since 2007 to this date is that um, more than 73,000 claims have already been collected by the ONRAR team. These claims have been processed. Uh, they, they go through a translation team and through a legal review by our team in Vienna. Um, and this legal review results in a matrix where they make recommendations, our, our legal officers there make recommendations on whether or not the claims meet the eligibility criteria, um, which include, of course, most of all, uh, to prove there is an interest and to prove that there is a causation link with the construction of the wall. Uh, once this passes the matrix, then the board reviews the recommendations by the legal officers and the board takes the final decision on whether to include these claims or not in, in, as part of the register. So to this date, from the 73,000 claims that have been collected, which include more than 1 million documents and pieces of evidence, um, the board has already decided on a bit more than 41,000 claims. So we're still uh, we're still going, there's still uh, lots of work to do. and. Um, um, I think that just uh, to close, of course, this is, as I mentioned, this is an example of, of an innovative way to go around uh, some obstacles in the political scene. But also, I do want to make sure that to, to emphasize that um, while there was not a, 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 or there was not identified a, a will to create a compensations commission and to pay reparations on behalf of Israel. The truth is that um, UNRWA is also a good example of the way you have to navigate and negotiate with different actors uh, during the work of one of these of one of these um, uh, commissions. And I'm sure that the Ukraine example uh, uh, that will follow will will also tell us a bit more about this. Israel does not. Um, is not does not hinder UNRWA's work. On the contrary, um, Israel allows uh, UNRWA to work on the on the ground, and this is very important. And we have a good collaboration with both Israel and the uh, Palestinians um, on this on this work, which has been essential. Another essential political thing that has allowed our work is the fact that UNRWA's work is is it works very low key. We're not a political organization. We're not politically mandated. It is a completely technical work that we do there um, uh, on the legal aspect. And, and finally, of course, well, there is a, a big challenge on the funding um, because our claim intake team and all the work on the ground, uh, while UNRWA itself does depend on the, on the UN regular budget, the claim intake on the ground depends on voluntary contributions. And there is a great challenge there. Um, and this is an example also for other models where you do need to have a very important political relationship to get the funding for voluntary contributions that is so essential to our work. I'll leave it at there, Monica. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mariana. And I think your um, answer betrays the need simultaneously to have in mind sort of the big picture political landscape within which one has to navigate, as well as like the nitty gritty details of actually accepting all of these documents, setting up the process, um, reviewing them, getting the sort of like the technical mechanics in order so that you the, so that the, the register the commission can actually do its work and so Mark Jan, I think that's a really nice pivot point to ask you now that we've heard sort of Patrick lay out sort of the big picture of the register for damages for Ukraine tell us a little bit about the mechanics of how the register is operating I understand that just this week you started accepting claims and so I think many people will be curious to know like how that is going, um, but just also more generally, um, the mechanics of the register and how it's working. Uh, thank you very much, Monica, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Register of Damage for Ukraine represents the biggest meeting of minds of state in response uh, to the Russian aggression against Ukraine in a practical sense. Um, following the long and arduous, uh, but also very quick process that Bart, Pat Patrick has, discovered, uh, has, has described, um, the, the Register of Damage was established just six months after the General Assembly passed a resolution on the 14th uh, of November 2022. It was announced in May of last year, um, uh, and uh, we went very quickly uh, about operationalizing the, the Register of Damage. Um, 
on the 1st of July, I had the honor of becoming employee number one uh, of the register uh, after being nominated uh, and appointed by the member states. The register of damage has 44 members, 43 states in the European Union, uh, including the entirety of G7, um, and that uh, membership is, uh, is, is growing. Um, the register of damage, uh, uh, in designing the register of damage, unsurprisingly, we looked at other uh, precedents, including the other register of damage that Mariana has uh, just talked about. Um, and unsurprisingly, there are a lot of similarities, including in nomenclature. Uh, we also have the executive director, uh, we also have the board, we also have the secretariat, we also have a claim form or claim forms, uh, and we also have categories of claims. Uh, but this is more or less where the similarities probably end. Um, the register of damage, it would be uh, the register of damage for Ukraine, it would be um, not proper to view the, just the register in isolation because the register of damage is just the first component to a bigger compensation mechanism. Uh, not just in the sense of political understanding of that uh, of that statement, but that's the ri directly written in our statute. Uh, not only that, but the register will become part of the compensation mechanism once it is established and the work on that is uh, already ongoing. Um, the, because of that, the register of damage um, is mandated to serve just as a record of claims. So very similar to UNRWA, the register of damage just collects the claims assesses uh, whether they uh, tick all the boxes on eligibility, um, and if so, makes a permanent record of those claims uh, in the register. The records, the, the criteria of eligibility are extremely simple and very broad. To be included in the register of damage for Ukraine, the claim must relate to the damage that has occurred in the territory of Ukraine on the 24th of February 2022 or after, and must be linked to the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. There are also, of course, a number of technical criteria, claims must be submitted by an appropriate claimant, and so on and so forth. But these three uh, basic pillars uh, uh, form the basis of the eligibility requirements for the register of damage. Um, in the nine months uh, since the inception of the register of damage, as I mentioned, we uh, have a secretariat, uh, which is uh, still quite small, smaller than UNRODS. Uh, we do have a board member, uh, we do have a board, uh, and I'm acutely aware of two of the board members sitting in this room, so everything that I say is strictly under their control. Um, uh, but uh, also, after nine months uh, of our work, we were able to adopt the first set of rules and regulations of, of, of the register, including the rules of procedure for claims, uh, the claim can, list of claim categories that includes 44 different categories of claims, and the first claim form. The first, because we, are, uh, we have launched with the first of many categories, uh, we're beginning our claims process with the claims related to, to damage and destruction to residential real estate. Uh, we have the luxury of doing uh, the launch uh, in, a, in a phased manner, step by step, because we are the first uh, such mechanism probably in the world's history to rely exclusively on digital data and digital method of claim submissions. We are using um, an application that is called DIA. It is a Ukrainian government services app. Uh, that is used by more than 20 million Ukrainians that allows submission of claim literally from the phone. Uh, they, uh, you wanted mechanics, so get ready for some technical data. Uh, the claim form for damage and destruction to residential real estate includes more than 200 data fields, uh, of which more than three quarters are drawn automatically from various Ukrainian registers and databases it, we are really lucky that Ukraine is one of the most digitized countries in Europe, and we are able to do that. Of the 200 data fields, only 16 are required from the claimant to put in manually in order to, to be able to submit a claim. Uh, that includes the possibility for claimants to uh, attach their own information, their own files, their own evidence, um, and send it uh, to, uh, to the register. Uh, in testing, uh, and I emphasize that it was just in testing, uh, the in the simplest way uh, of the process, the process, uh, the, the the time uh, that it took for uh, an unfamiliar claimant to fill the claim for missing submit a claim was seven and a half minutes. So we opened that process on the sec on the second of April. So if you see black circles under my eyes, that's because we worked very hard to to meet to meet that date. Uh, and in the first 72, hour, 72 hours of the register's operation, we have received 810 claims. 
Uh, we did that without any advertising, without uh, any big announcements, uh, any you know uh, push messages into people's phones, because we want to make sure that our system works without any glitches and bugs before receiving thousands of claims. Altogether, across 44 categories of claims, uh, we expect to receive anywhere between six and eight million of claims, uh, and we need to be prepared to to handle that uh, that kind of data. The purpose of the register is to create a record upon which the Future Claims Commission and the Future Compensation Mechanism will rely uh, in its work. Uh, sometimes that presents uh, unique and very difficult challenges for us because we have to have the foresight to imagine and to think what it is that the Claims Commission would need to have as guidance, as standards, as criteria from our work. So all our decisions, for example, that go into the design of claim forms, requirements for evidence and the standards for evidence, um, they, they, we, we need to think ahead uh, and consider uh, uh, things that the future claims commission, which will be, we do not know how it will be established yet, on what basis, in what form, uh, and in what format, how that commission will, will uh, see uh, information coming from us uh, in, based on, on the requirements that we have presented. So that um, uh, puts us uh, in a difficult, at times, situation, a challenging situation, where we have to have that foresight to think ahead and also to make sure that the register itself does not prejudice in its decision-making the work of a claims commission. Um, so we're uh, having quite uh, interesting, fascinating discussions with our board members to, to look at, at these things. Um, um, I, I quite realized that I might uh, talk for hours, uh, so I will stop here, um, and uh, I hope that was insightful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And Emma, I think that's a really great um, entry point for you. So you have like millions of claims coming into these processes, and necessarily the capacity of the processors um, at, to spend time on any particular claim is, is, is extremely limited. And that might be both a virtue and a vice of these processes. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to um, how this feels from the perspective of the victims and the survivors who are um, sort of pushed into these processes, especially given I know that you've also done some work for the Clooney Foundation in the ICC and in domestic um, venues. And so how do you draw on those experiences in like sort of a, a criminal setting, basically, um, to compare um, the experience of victims and survivors relative to what, what they face when they work through one of these compensation mechanisms? Um, thanks. Thanks for that, Monica, and thank you for the invitation to the organisers uh, to join you today. So, sort of taking a step back, if we think about victims and survivors' right to a remedy and rep reparation, foundational principles of international law um, in the human rights context, we go back to the Universal Declaration, um, we go through the ICCPR, we go through to the Convention on the Rights of the Child in, in, the, in the international humanitarian law context. We have um, the Hague Conventions, the Geneva Conventions, the Rome Statute. Um, and, and what are victims entitled to? What, what's the content um, of that right? Um, I, I'm going to focus on three components um, and, and assess sort of how we've been doing in the context of mass claims procedures. Um, so first, the right to equal and effective justice. Um, second, adequate, effective and prompt reparation for the harm suffered. Um, third, the right of access to relevant information concerning violations and reparations mechanisms. Um, and I think what we've heard from Markian suggests with the digital sort of the digitization of the process that we're making real steps. Um, on that last component um, that that you know really distinguishes where we are today um, from previous claims commission examples. Um, obviously, we have hundreds of examples um, of mass claims commissions going back as far as the the Jay Treaty in 1794, which set up a mixed claims commission between Great Britain and the U.S. Um, all of them to a greater or lesser degree, if you compare, if you look at them against uh, the um, those three criteria I set out, have fallen short. But as do all accountability processes, um, including international criminal processes, domestic criminal processes. Um, but 
but let's dive in a little bit more um, and look at sort of access to justice. And I, I wanted to pick up on a point uh, Monica made in her introduction um, about non-international armed conflicts, um, which are the majority uh, of the conflicts that are occurring in the world today. There are over 100 conflicts going on um, as we speak, the majority are non-international. The setting up of claims commissions um, typically arises out of incidents between states, uh, so in the international context. Um, so we do, looking at victims and survivors of conflicts across the world, have a gap there. Um, and it has been, you know, the charge of selectivity has been made. Um, so I'm, and, and against that, backdrop, I'm reminded of Justice Sabella's uh, very moving and powerful uh, remarks yesterday at the assembly um, when she said, we must never forget what the world looks like to those who are most vulnerable. Um, and that that is what we are doing this all for, right? Um, we've heard very technical um, discussions, procedural discussions, um, the types of claims, um, the register of damage for Ukraine is, is taking uh, claims now for destruction of residential real estate. It's people's homes. Um, so I think, you know, centering that in the work that we are doing, the very technical, the very important, the very challenging legal work um, is absolutely critical. Um, for many conflicts, including non-international armed conflicts where we may not see a claims commission set up, the majority of conflicts we won't see a claims commission set up. Um, what then for survivors? And I'll just, I'll, I'll come in with just a couple of points um, on some of the work we do um, at the Cleaning Foundation for Justice in, in the criminal space um, to try to put money in victims and survivors' pockets as well as putting perpetrators behind bars. So I'm going to focus on, on the options um, for reparations for victims in that context as a contrast to the Claims Commission process. Um, so the ICC, the International Criminal Court, um, has uh, a process for reparations, including um, the Trust Fund for victim, Victims. Um, there have been a number of reparations um, orders that have included compensation for victims um, in proceedings after defendants have been found guilty. Um, so we have three examples so far. Um, in the, the case of Al Mahdi, 2.7 million euros um, for the costs of individual and collective um, reparations to the community in Timbuktu for deliberately targeting historic buildings in that city um, were awarded um, in the Ganda case, uh, a much bigger number, 30 million uh, US dollars awarded, um, including measures of restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, and satisfaction. Um, and then most recently, uh, just this past February, in the Ongwen case, um, the court set financial liability of Mr. Ongwen to 52 and a half million euros um, and ordered collective and community-based reparations. Um, so it, it is happening in that context. Challenges there too. Um, in terms of, of evidence from the communities or at reports from the communities where that uh, that reparation is going, there's challenge and frustration um, amongst victims, um, including with the amount that is paid um, out to victims. Um, many victims find the amount that they're paid insufficient to the rulings and the seriousness um, of the charges in the cases. Um, criticisms with distribution processes, um, with applications being de declared ineligible um, and causing discontent among local residents. Um, perhaps lessons there um, in the claims uh, context. In the, in the context of um, universal jurisdiction proceedings, um, so where criminal uh, cases are brought in the domestic 
reports, um, it's a mixed bag. Um, often it won't be possible for victims to seek compensation in the context of proceedings. In some jurisdictions, um, it is uh, Coming, coming back to, to the Ukraine example, since the full-scale invasion, um, the CFJ has been working on gathering evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity um, to support the triggering of criminal prosecutions uh, and bring justice to survivors. Um, so last October, we filed three cases with German prosecutors, um, which target high and mid-level commanders identified as likely suspects. Um, one case addresses an indiscriminate missile attack in Odessa, another on unlawful de detentions uh, and executions in Kharkiv, uh, and a third highlights a pattern of crimes in the Kiev region um, during the occupation, including killing, executions, detention, torture, and looting. Um, those cases have been taken up by German prosecutors. Investigations have been opened, and Germany has some jurisprudence that permits uh, victims and survivors in the context of criminal cases to uh, receive reparations, with awards having been made um, against uh, one member of ISIS um, for um, a, an award of compensation. Um, by the criminal court, in another case, the, the compensation issue referred, referred to a civil court um, by the criminal court. And in the third case, it was considered but uh, not, um, not awarded in the particular case. Um, so I think there are some lessons there. I'll stop there. Um, some lessons there in thinking about how we're processing claims in the mass claims context to ensure um, that we are not foreclosing um, rights to reparations for victims. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, there are so many questions that I have based on just these initial remarks. And so, um, Patrick, let me come back to you. I want to I want to pick up on something that Emma just said about um, needing to get money in the hands of victims and survivors and um, make them feel in some sense, they're never going to feel whole, but make them, make them compensate them for some of the, the severe harms that they've suffered. And the question is, how do you, as you were thinking about um, constructing the mechanism for Ukraine, how did you balance on the one hand the desire to get money in the hands of victims and survivors, and on the other, the sense that the government itself um, ought to um, have money in its hands so that it can engage in large-scale reconstruction activities on behalf of the people. And, and there's always going to be a finite amount of money um, to be distributed in any particular area or conflict situation. And so inevitably, there are trade-offs to be made between getting money in the hands of victims and survivors on the one hand and getting, getting money and assistance to the government to engage in sort of reconstructive efforts on behalf of the population as a whole. So how, do you, how did you think about that balance um, as you went, as you embarked on this process of trying to get the register from Ukraine underway? That's absolutely excellent question. And I can tell you it was, it was front of mind in every uh, conversation that we we had. I, I mean, the the majority of conversations were led by uh, Markian and, and a minister from Ukraine, and the conversations that the three of us would have always started with the amount of money and damage um, that has that that has resulted from from this full scale invasion is almost too large to contemplate, and we were very focused on the the widow in Mariupol above and beyond kind of kind of commercial claimants right so there was always a conversation about um politically and um it, from a matter of justice priority right so there was that question but of course you know the state itself needs um to be reconstructed once this is once this is over um so those were always top of mind but but it came back to um we tried our best to eschew questions of assets until after the mechanism was more or less created. Um, because politically, we understood that there was will, political will, to create the mechanism. Um, and the tougher question of how it was going to be funded 
we could put aside a little bit toward toward um, as a kind of second order question. So yes, it's an incredibly important question, but it was not a question that we were actively engaged in during the creation of. The only, the only way that it really came into a lot of the negotiations and discussions in a bilateral level with the state's parties who are now um, members of the um, commission, it was through the UNRWA example. And this gets back to Mariana's point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were very conscious of not creating a right without a remedy, um, not creating an expectation of compensation by putting a claim into something without a mechanism, without something that would adjudicate those claims and eventually pay out, right? And we were very clear about that in our UN General Assembly resolution. So for, for us, it was about that syllogism, right? It was about that. And then the question of heads of claims, who would be in priority, that was for the board, right? This, this kind of amorphous future thing that now exists. But that was easy for us to kind of have that conversation. So that was the conversation that we went into. But but you know, Mark Jan, you supplement anything that I said there. If, if I can just, Sorry. just uh, add, add the thought to that, which I think is really important, is that we, we reject a notion that we have to make compromise on compensation. We reject to uh, use the concept of finite resources as uh, an assumption that we have to take into account in building these mechanisms. Uh, we are uh, in a fallacy a little bit because of this notion of Russian assets that sit somewhere frozen that have a number, that have an amount. And we think, oh, that's the limit. But that should not be the limit. If there had not been that money uh, frozen uh, in various accounts, the 300 billion, it would not have changed anything in what we are doing to build these mechanisms. The starting point is that every victim should be compensated, whether that victim is an individual, a business, or a government. And, and from that starts our work. And the okay. UNCC gives us guidance, mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so Mark, let me just follow up with you then um, uh, on what you just said, um, and ask a, a, the question slightly differently, which is um, so um, the harms caused in Ukraine are monumental, and the you might say like, well, um, the frozen government assets should not be the limit. The you know the sky is the limit, really, given the harms that have been caused. And then the question I have, and I think maybe people in the audience have, is, well, at what point um, do you think to yourself, if we um, impose on a government such harsh, uh, such a harsh response to their evident, obviously, by all accounts, egregious conduct, are we debilitating them to the point that they will feel so left out of the system that they have no, no uh, reason not to continue to cause further harm and damage to the system and engage in similar conduct elsewhere because they view the system, they in this context, Russia views the entire system as corrupted and slanted against them. So they might as well um, continue to perpetrate harms elsewhere. Well, <laughs> or, or, or to, and, and, and to put the, and, and to put the question a little bit more sympathetically, because <laughs> that might not be. A, well, how about the Russian people, who um, will necessarily bear the burdens of some of the costs that the government is required to pay? And at what point does one think, okay, we really actually should limit the extent to which we are imposing these costs on the government of Russia and on the people of Russia, who will uh, suffer the consequences in one way or another? Um, down the road. Thanks. This is a really good question. In answering that, allow me to maybe take off my director hat and uh, put on my Ukrainian hat a little bit, uh, because I think that it, it is not, uh, it, you know, these are not things of the same orders of magnitude when you compare the suffering of Russian people and suffering of Ukrainian people. Um, so they should not be in the same sentence. Um, uh, and that translates into our legal work uh, in compensating those who have suffered because of violations of international law by a state against the other state. So that's, this is the starting point and this is the ending point of that premise. Um, it is also not entirely fair to say that the sky is the limit to damages. No, the numbers might be very high, but there will always be a number. And the purpose of the work of the Register and of the Claims Commission is to find that number through painstaking, legitimate, legal, evidence-based, due process-driven work. 
at the end of the process, we will have that number, which will be split among the millions of victims who will have submitted uh, the claims to us. And in understanding how we could uh, reach that number by actual compensation, we do not need to reinvent the bicycle. We can just look into one of the precedents that we've discussed here, the UNCC, when there was a compensation fund that was established. That was Iraq was making contributions to that compensation fund until every single compensation award issued by a claims commission was satisfied. Yeah, it took 31 years and it took $52.4 billion, but until every claim was exhausted, Iraq was making contributions. There is no reason why that same thing should not be replicated here. Uh, but if Russia does not want to cooperate, then we will look for alternatives. And thankfully, we have that 300 billion worth of an alternative. Can I just two finger that really quickly? Sure. Uh, I, I do. I actually do think Russia will participate eventually, and and I'll tell you why um, very quickly. Russia will will participate eventually, in my view, because if it does not, it will be subject to suit in all of the capital markets, the major capital markets of the world. Right, and then Russia will become Iran, because there will be judgments against it in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in France, and they will not be able to put their money there ever. And if you are a Russian oligarch, you want to be rich in London. You don't just want to be rich in Cyprus. And they will participate because otherwise, the capital markets will be foreclosed to them. Okay, great. And I, th Mariana, this I think presents an opportunity to pivot back to you and to tie in. Uh, what Patrick and Markian just said to another point that Emma made earlier about charges of selectivity um, and where attention gets focused and where it does not. And so you said in your initial remarks that, um, you know, part of the way in which Unrod works and is able to do its job is sort of staying b below the radar screen. You know, like you do your job. It's not high politics, it's technical craft of collecting these claims of processing them. Um, and things basically run smoothly and you avoid the sort of political landmines. Although, um, you know, when push comes to shove and you actually want to get the funding for, uh, to pay out some of these claims, you're going to, it's going to, you're going to have to take it up a level to, um, a more politically salient level. And so I guess the question for you is how you think about, I know there, I know there are limits on what you can say, um, given your position, but how you think about, um, the charges of selectivity and the need to operate below while at the same time at the, the political level in order to make sure that you can at the same time do your technical work, but also in the end uh, get the funding that you need to pay out the claims um, that you're receiving and processing. Thank you so much. This is an excellent point, Monica. And, and, and yes, what I said is that our work is not political. I know it's in the midst of a very political conflict, but our work is totally technical. And even the fundraising, of course, this requires a big effort from the executive director and from the board itself to engage with actors that could be supporting uh, the funding of claim intaking. This is not to support the payment of losses. It's a very different amount. It's a, it's a, it's a lower amount than, than the examples that were mentioned of, of for example, UNCC, what, what UNCC actually paid for compensation. So of course there is this political side, but I think that UNRWA in that sense has done it uh, quite well in the sense that we have bilateral exchanges. Uh, there's no inflammatory political statements on one side or the other. And this is very important. I also want to say that um, I, I fully agree with with, with uh, Patrick and with Mark in the, in the sense that, of course, that a register of damages makes absolute more sense uh, if there is a compensations commission and an actual payment of compensations. In this case, in the Unrod case, I think that there was not this option uh, that there was for Ukraine to, to go to the Council of Europe, to go through the veto and the Security Council, right? So I think that here, um, what we're looking at is maybe a hope that even though there is no possibility at the near future of compensation, that damages have to be recorded because maybe someday there might be a peace process and maybe in that peace process, the damage and the amount, the, the damage has to uh, have a process, a second stage, hopefully, where this, this damage can actually result in compensations, hopefully. There has also been discussion by some scholars, this is uh, very new, but some people have actually thought of maybe uh, even assuming the compensation 
by another party. This is something that's quite far-fetched, but it's not out of the radar, right? So maybe if the, the main responsible party does not uh, uh, does not have the political will to pay, uh, eventually there might be a solution where uh, a different type of, of fund is obtained in order to pay the victim. So I think that even though uh, when political will is lacking, uh, it might be frustrating, I think that this doesn't mean that we don't have to record damages and, 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 and preserve evidence. And we've also, as we, we've also seen in the examples of the mechanisms that have been created for Syria or for Myanmar, uh, the III and the, the IIIM. Um, so I think that this is, this is just ways to go through the, the system and to try to go around the veto blocking the Security Council. And Mariana, if I may just stay with you for one minute to ask a, another question. Uh, we're at the point in the conversation, by the way, when I'm sort of uh, sifting through questions and trying to pull a couple together and um, present them to the panelists. So please keep your questions coming. Um, and Mariana, there are a number of questions um, that are in the register of, no pun intended, um, uh, now that we're seeing the situation in the Palestinian territories deteriorate so severely. Um, what, what prospects do you see for UNRWAD either expanding its mandate to address issues not simply relating to the uh, construction of the war of the wall, but also to um, the most uh, the current, the ongoing conflict? Um, and if not UNRWAD, uh, do you do you think um, there are any, there's any possibility that the ICJ in the pending case might um, either uh, create another mechanism or encourage the General Assembly to create another mechanism relating to um, the situation now in, in Gaza? So thank you for this question, Monica. So uh, a few states, not many, but a few have actually mentioned in the debates in the General Assembly and now in the hearings uh, on the advisory opinion that is that has been requested to the ICJ on the consequences in general of the occupation. A few states have mentioned the idea of possibly creating a register of damages for Gaza. Um, at this point, it's impossible for us to, to anticipate if the UNRWAD mandate would be expanded or not, because UNRWAD has a very distinct mandate that works on the wall. It, has, it, it does not work in Gaza. Uh, so this is something to be determined politically by states uh, in a resolution. Um, I do think, and as the Ukrainian example also attests to, I do think that even though a register of damages is created or an, or an existing register like UNRWAD is expanded in its mandate, um, if it's a new one, you need to base yourself and, and you need to use the know-how of other registers. And this is uh, what has been done for the Ukrainian example. And, and, and Patrick and Mark have, have told us how they actually went through the whole history of compensations and claim mechanisms to, to find the, the exact model uh, that would be suitable for the Ukraine situation. So I would say the same for, for Gaza. There is, of course, a very important know-how um, by UNRWAD, but by also all these other mechanisms. And it's better not to start from scratch uh, in the sense uh, of, of trying to use institutional and, and lessons learned, institutional good practices and lessons learned uh, to create something new. But again, this is not something we can anticipate. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on, on the states and on, on the resolution that would eventually come out of uh, uh, the results of the advisory opinion of the ICJ. Uh-huh. Uh, I see Patrick has a two finger here and I will give him the two finger, but I will also ask him to answer a question within that two finger span, which is about um, the another 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 question relating to selectivity before I move it back to Emma, which is um, how much um, do you feel the consequences of the failure to establish such a mechanism for the um, widely perceived to be unlawful invasion of Iraq in 2003 um, as impeding your work in trying to get the Register of Ukraine up and running? And I ask the question because as everyone knows, almost immediately the conflict in Ukraine um, took on the tenor of a geopolitical contest between uh, the United States and its allies on the one hand and Russia on the other, with a lot of states sort of 
uh, although perhaps be, although behind this register, nevertheless, really being quite hesitant to come out too strongly um, or do too much in response to the invasion. And so how much has that dynamic affected your work? And then you can also say whatever you wanted to say with your two fingers. Well, that's a that's a big question. So thank you for giving me the two finger, but also the, <laughs> the, the so it it was present. Right. It was present in our discussions. It was present in our mind. It was certainly present in the vote in on November 14th, 2022. It was present in the amount of the G77 that we were able to um, uh, get to to sign on as a matter of principle. Um, so it was present. But but we were kind of very narrowly trying to focus exclusively on on this specific instance, because obviously we wanted as many stakeholders involved as possible, and we wanted the force of, of the G7 that was holding several Russian assets to be fully on board. So there were political aspects of this, and we didn't want to try to do do too much, but those are those are very good questions for, for academics and, and, and in some ways diplomats to, to handle. My two finger was another kind of point on the under theorized aspect of both UNRWA and now the, the Ukraine um, register in that both are examples of a register of damage, potentially one leading towards a mechanism for claims that are ongoing while the conflict continues, right? And that's, that's, that's unique and under theorized in one very interesting way in my view is what is the role of a claims commission that is set up during a conflict to create peace, right? So it is a it is in our view, and this is something that we we said to capitals, is you know the creation of a registry of damage is an aspect of the creation. It, it, it helps to create a, a, a place for peace, right? How, right? It gives you an amount, right? It, it gives you something to negotiate at at the table. It gives you an amount. It places the victim at the forefront of the conversation. And if you believe Grotius, and we have a lecture on him at the society, so bringing the society back, Grotius, one of his many, many genius um, statements was, you, you cannot win peace without reparation. Okay. Emma? <laughs> what he said. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, we're, I, I'm seeing we're running out of time. And I, again, I'm, I'm picking up on some of the questions and also asking, uh, for, asking my own. Let's, you raised this question of selectivity, which is, I think, a quite salient one. And now we've talked about the situation in Ukraine and other processes, but tell us a little bit about um, the situation in internal conflicts for which such mechanisms are generally not established and how you think about in your work um, on behalf of victims and survivors, um, how to bring some justice and get money in the hands of people in these situations, which of course, as you said, are the majority of conflicts in the world. Thank you. So, I mean, really it's, it's doing what we do as lawyers, many of us do, is building cases, right? And it, it goes to the point of what what information is included in those 200 fields on the claim form? Um, what information can you collect on the ground um, to working with victims and survivors hand in hand to be able to build cases that then can be brought in jurisdictions around the world? Um, we have a universal jurisdiction case in Argentina against members of the security course forces in Venezuela, for example. Um, that has been brought um, cases uh, where we're working with survivors of sexual and gender-based violence in the DRC um, being brought against a uh, former Congolese warlord in France in a case that's going to trial next year. Um, so it, it, it's that case building element we do as lawyers of looking at the facts on the ground, um, looking at the evidence. Um, and there I think the, the you know, an interesting parallel to the, the point about digitization um, that we've been discussing is, is what that means from an evidentiary perspective um, and how one, um, you know, can use open source intelligence, publicly available data, um, whether from broadcast TV, radio, websites, social media, satellite imagery, um, to help build these kinds of cases to, to create a fuller picture of 
what happens in conflict um, and to try to get some measure of accountability um, and hopefully reparations for survivors. And as your one final question, I see I have just a couple seconds left. As you're um, building these cases, to what extent are you able to think simultaneously about and 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 achieve simultaneously uh, reparations for victims and survivors on the one hand, and also broader systemic and structural uh, changes and um, distributions of of financial resources to the broader community beyond the specific litigants in the case um, who also have suffered grave harms but are simply not the ones who are sort of the, the focus of attention in any particular case? It's a really good point. Crim you know, criminal proceedings are not a great mechanism for achieving reparations at scale to affected communities. Um, so then I think, you know, I. I I think the ICC and that reparations process, um, the Trust Fund for Victims has had problems. Uh, it is woefully underfunded. It is um, reliant on voluntary contributions. We've talked about the problem of voluntary con contributions and funding. Um, and, and so it has faced challenges in terms of what it is able to distribute and, and some criticisms about the ways in which it has done that. Um, but I think we, you know, we need to support the mechanisms we have um, and all of the ones we've discussed today uh, you know there are funding the sky should be the limit um, there should be no you know there should be full compensation full reparation for all injuries sustained um, but the reality as we all know is a bit different and I think that's a call you know that's very much a call not just for us as lawyers but for the politicians and the diplomats and community leaders and the technocrats, uh, technologists, um, to, to really come together. Okay, great. Well, I think that's a really great stopping point. Also, we heard the clapping next door, which is our <laughs> cue that it's time to end. I have um, been told that the code word, the secret word for CLE credit if you signed up to receive it is zebra. So um, please in insert that wherever you need to do it. And please join me in thanking this incredible group of panelists. I feel like I could talk to them all day.